We're in Janvier at Sequoia, and this is the Catalyst for Responsibility session. We have a nice intimate group. You're joining us on maybe Thursday or Friday or maybe on Sunday morning or Sunday evening. Maybe you're in your pajamas. If you are, keep it covered up. And uh, we thank you for joining us. Okay, so the last three weeks we've been talking about systems, right? And we put a lot of emphasis on all kinds of systems. And if you haven't had a chance, go in and look at the system on delegation, the system on motivation, the system on effective communication. There's a lot of other systems on the portal for you to take advantage of. Um, but somebody some, tell me something that you took away from the last three weeks. Lot of information, but maybe something. Maybe around time. Uh, maybe you did the TAM matrix exercise where you track your time. Something you took away from the last three weeks. Kind of just how uh, time is valuable. Kind of cherish every moment you've got. Mm. Okay. Why not be? 86,000 seconds is up. You're like. That's very true. <laughs> it's pretty amazing, isn't it? And especially when, I don't know if you, any of you had the chance, or any of you that are watching had the chance to do that time matrix assignment. When you start tracking your time, you start realizing that there's a lot of time that isn't focused on anything. Now, it doesn't mean we have to be compulsive or obsessed with doing something every minute. But it does mean that we have to keep in the forefront of our mind what you said. Am I just wasting time? There's a difference between leisure, rest, relaxation, and just aimlessly wasting time. Uh, wasting time worrying. Wasting time uh, contemplating the worst thing that can happen. Wasting time worrying about all the things we can't control, right? I mean, we do waste a lot of time in those ways that uh, certainly don't serve us any benefit. All right, somebody else, something that you took from the last three weeks. Did any of you look at the other videos? Do you have a chance to look at the other videos? The, if you have a chance, and remember I told you that there would be more information than you could access or that you could take in in three, three weeks. If you get a chance, look at some of those other videos because those other videos provide other systems and other tools for, uh, for you to put in your toolkit. So the bottom line is this. We know we have to have effective systems. So the, the next competency, the next area of focus, we have to kind of take a little bit of a historical journey to understand it. So in my own life, I noticed that there was a lot of people that I met that no matter who their boss was, they did a great job. And then there was other people that I met that no matter who their boss was, they did a crappy job. And then there was people that I met who were successful, no matter what the environment or situation they were put in. And then there was other people that I met, no matter how many advantages they got, they always screwed it up. And I was trying to figure out what, what was it? What was the thing that they had or didn't have that helped them to be a success or help them that, that you know, led them to not being a success? And then I started to notice that neighborhoods were the same way. There were some neighborhoods where the neighborhood was always clean, always well maintained. People took care of their houses. People took care of their places. And then there was other places that they didn't. And then I noticed that there was companies that they just had this, this way that they did things and they did them really well and they were great at it. And then there was companies that just, no matter who their leaders were, they kind of sucked. And was there some correlation between those that did and those that didn't? Those that succeeded and those that failed? Those that accomplished and those that never did? Was there some correlation? And, and I don't know if you've made the same observations that there are sometimes there's people that just got it and don't. But I said to myself, that can't be. You can't just be either born a success. Because there was also a lot of examples of people that had failed. You know, you look at Einstein, right? When Einstein was a kid, they said that he was slow. They kicked him out of school. They thought he had needed remedial training. 
You know, you look at so many other uh, highly successful people, even Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and all these great icons that we know are successful. Oprah Winfrey failed how many times? Thomas Edison failed thousands of times before he came up with the light bulb. So we also know that people can turn it around. So I said to myself, what is that key ingredient? And I also look for a historical reference point. So the key ingredient that I came up with was that they, they were responsible. They were responsible. They did what they were supposed to do, when they were supposed to do it. Now, I don't mean that they balanced their checkbook necessarily, and I don't mean that they never got arrested. I'm not saying that. But in the thing that they wanted to do, they were responsible. They took the steps they needed to take. They, they executed what needed to be done. They stayed up all night long if it was necessary. They came in early. They stayed late. They did the stuff that needed to be done where others weren't willing to do that. So I said to myself, huh, is there places I've seen this personally? And there was a lady that I met. Her name was Maria Amazola. Maria Amazola. She was a maid at the hotel that I ran. Now, this is a very big hotel. We had 300 maids, a lot of maids. She was not an English speaker natively. She was from uh, Ecuador. She was Ecuadorian. In her home country, I did not know this, but in her home country, she had a PhD. But in the States, she was a maid. She had come there to find a better life, and she was a maid. And she was a great maid. I mean, she was like the greatest maid I've ever seen in my life. I mean, she, we put her in charge of our, our VIP high roller suites. She had to keep them clean, you know, 3,000, 4,000 square foot suite, and she's keeping it, as big as a house, and she's keeping it immaculate, right? This is Maria Amazola. So I went up to her one day, and I, and I wanted to find out why. You know, why are you so damn good at what you do? So through a translator, I said, Miss Amazola, you know, I, congratulations, you know, you're the employee of the month or whatever it was, employee of the quarter, and uh, congratulate, congratulate you on outstanding work. I said, why are you so good at this? Why does everybody respect you? Why does everybody admire you? And I was about 27 at the time, very young from the position that I was in. And, and she looked at me, and through a translator, she said, she said, mijo, which mijo means little boy. So she was calling me little boy. So I'm the vice president, and she's calling me little boy. But, you know, we'll look past that. So she says, uh, little boy, what you don't understand is who I work for. And I said, I, I don't understand you. What do you mean, I don't understand who I work for? And she said, she said, you don't understand who I work for. And I said, well, who do you work for? She said, well, I don't work for you. So, you know, I'm not too happy about that. Because really, technically, I guess she didn't, but she, I was her boss's boss's boss. Okay, you don't work for me, all right? And she said, and I don't work for Mr. Carano. That was the man that owns a lot of stuff, who I work directly for. I don't work for you, and I don't work for Mr. Carano. Now, this is through a translator. She said to me, I do my work unto God. And I thought, wow. And I said, what do you mean? She said, I'm going to do a good job no matter who supervises me. I'm going to do a good job no matter who manages me. I'm going to do a good job because I do a good job. And I thought to myself, what an amazing sense of professionalism. What an amazing sense of commitment. What an amazing sense of just who she was as a person, that no matter what the work she was doing, a PhD back home or a maid in another country, she's going to do a great job. And that's when it dawned on me, could I create an environment as a leader or could I create an atmosphere as a leader to replicate that? Could we get that out of other people? Could we get other people to have that same level of commitment or that same level of determination, could we do that? And then I thought back to the things I mentioned earlier. I thought, well, in those neighborhoods that I've seen that everybody takes care of things, not everybody's great. There must be something that, that takes the people that aren't so great up a notch. Might be the peer pressure, it might be who knows what. 
I looked at athletic teams and I thought to myself, you know, there's some athletic teams that are always really, really good. They're always great teams. So could we as leaders create an environment where other people would take greater responsibility than they did the day before? Could we as leaders get kids, let's say, to do more than they did the day before? Could we get citizens and community members to do things more than they did the day before? Because if I could get two more, three more, five more maids to act like Maria Amazola, our company was going to be more successful. Or if I could get three more, five more, eight more citizens to act like the citizens in Fort Chip, these ladies in Fort Chip are just kicking butt, right? They've, they've formed a parent uh, and school council, and they've, they've, they've started to clean up the school, and they're going to build a playground. And I mean, they're making things happen, aren't they? Unbelievable. It is unbelievable. So you got these boot camps. These are just uh, very informal leaders who just have lived and worked there and just all their lives. All of a sudden said, after three weeks of reading all this stuff, I can't point the finger at them. I'm part of the problem. I got to do something. And they've started doing something. So, so I said to myself, there's got to be a way to make more Maria Amazolas who take tremendous pride in their work, pride in who they are as people, pride in the results around them, pride in what they do. How could I learn to create that in another human being? Now, I call it being a catalyst for responsibility. So a catalyst, what's a catalyst? Who remembers their science? Tim, what's a catalyst? It is uh, something that creates change, something introduced to the system that uh, unleashes change. Now, what's interesting about that, because that's a perfect definition, perfect explanation, there's one little addition to that is that there are already existing ingredients. And then the catalyst causes those ingredients to do something, right? They can cause them to come together, it can cause them to break apart, but it causes it to do something. So could we as leaders be a catalyst, that ingredient necessary to make something happen? Well, the thing we want to make happen is responsibility. Like imagine if every kid that you work with, tomorrow morning was 20% more responsible than they were the day before. What would that do? It would be amazing, wouldn't it? It would be a complete transformation. They, they, they would now start doing their homework. They would start doing this. They would start doing that. They'd clean stuff up. They'd be good with their parents. You know, They'd start cleaning up the community. They wouldn't be jacking around anymore. And, right? Wow. Or what if, in, what if this way? I'll say it this way. What if in Canada, every man, this is a heavy statement, what if every man that's fathered a child started paying for that child, started nurturing that child, started taking care of that child? Not just paying child support, but I'm talking about being a dad to that child. What if every dad in Canada did that? Would it transform the country? Huge. Huge. Responsibility. So what was that thing, what was that ingredient I was looking for? It was responsibility. That, 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 that I would take ownership, that I would, I would say, this is mine, I'll keep it clean. This is my community, it's a reflection of me. And so I'll give what I need to give to make the community a better place. Now what's interesting about that is if, if you do an exploration of history, let's take, for example, First Nations people. And let's talk about other indigenous people around the world. They understand that concept. Oh, how do you know that, Ian? Well, how do you think they survived for thousands of years? For thousands of years, they had to take care of each other and they had to take care of their community. So they knew what responsibility looked like. Now, what's funny is, not funny, ha-ha, but ironic, is when you go to many First Nations communities today, responsibility is absent. It's absent. And I, I'm not saying that to offend anybody, but I've said that before. I've said that at Six Nations of the Grand River. They asked me to come there and talk about suicide. They had an extreme suicide rate, extreme job drop rate. That's what they said. And Ian, will you come and help? Will you give us some insight? And you know what my insight was? For thousands of years, you've known how to raise your kids. For thousands of kids, you've instilled them with the qualities they needed to be successful citizens within your community. For thousands of years. Just do that. Just teach responsibility. Because the, the nation wouldn't have lived if people didn't understand responsibility. It would have died hundreds, 200, 500, 800 years ago, right? 
responsibility. So can you get the people around you to be more responsible than they, than they were the day before? Can you make sure that the citizens are more responsible in Fort McMurray? Can you make sure the kids are more responsible? Can I make sure the citizens of the nation are more responsible? I mean, it's not worth exactly. It's not worth not giving it a shot, eh? That's right. So we've already seen that in the case, we'll use this again, that's the case of Fort Chip. Three ladies took responsibility. The, the water in the bathroom was no longer running. I don't know, do I tell you guys the story the other day? Okay, so the water at the Fort Chip School in the boys' bathroom hasn't run. It's not running. And you know how long it has not been running? All year. There's been no water in the boys' bathroom all year. There's no stalls. So if I am a little boy, grade three, and I want to go and sit on the toilet, every other kid's going to watch me sit on the toilet. Now, what third grade boy, grade three boy is going to sit on the toilet while all of his friends watch? Nobody. And kicker, here's the kicker, no door to the bathroom. No water to wash your hands, no walls to sit and kick and go to the bathroom in private, and no door on the bathroom itself. Would, raise your hand if you think that's unacceptable. First of, all, first of all, it's a public health issue. And then if a kid does need to go to the bathroom, what are they going to do? They're going to go home. You know that. They're going to go home. And what happens as soon as that kid in Fort Chip goes home? He ain't coming back. He ain't coming back. So three moms... Connie, led by Connie and Tanya, Tanya, led by Tanya and, and Connie, okay, well, great oh, great ladies, yeah. and so they rose up and they were like, enough, we're getting this handled, today, water, today, the foyer of the school has been painted, hasn't been painted in how many ever years, today, now this is only in three weeks, today, they've got the walls being put in, they got the doors being put up, the doors, they're working on it because they don't have doors. They can't find the doors anymore, so they've got to order new doors. They took the doors off because for oh, who knows why. And now they can't find them. they got a new playground on the go in three weeks, right? Why? Because three ladies took responsibility for their community. So that's what we're talking about. Now, i got to take this one step further because i gotta, I got to I gotta give you a historical example. So there was a city way long time ago called Athens. Now there is an Athens today, but the Athens of today is just a relic of what the Athens was thousands of years ago. Little guys going to bed. Um, so this Athens, how many ever years ago, most historians say was probably the greatest city of all time. That it had commerce, and it had arts, and it had culture, and it had everything. And mostly, most of what Western society is today came from that town. Democracy, arts, culture, geometry. So much of what we know, so much of what we know about Western life, and even Western thinking, came from that town. And there was 30 years when that town was really at its peak. They call it the Golden Age. Now here's what you got to know about that town. It was a true democracy. Now, what does that mean? That means every citizen got to vote. And when I say they got to vote, I mean like on every decision. Six, eight, ten thousand people at a time would come together in the assembly, and they would debate things, and then they would all vote. They came together every day to vote on what the community would do. There was leaders, but there was ten of them, and they were equal. Not one, it wasn't, there wasn't a prime minister, there wasn't a president, there wasn't a king. Ten equal leaders. And it wasn't like politics today, where you have millions of dollars, and you've got a big machine, and you got campaign, none of that. Any one of those ten people could be voted out at any time, if the, if the population wanted them out. There was one leader that kind of rose above them all. His name was Pericles, and he's very famous throughout history. And, and I was intrigued by Athens, because I said, well, if that was the best city there ever was, what can we learn from it? And who was the leader during that time? Well, it was this guy, Pericles. And here's what Pericles said. Remember, I came to the conclusion it was responsibility that really set it apart. And after I came to that conclusion, here's what Pericles said. He said, if Athens would appear great to you, so basically, if you think our town's really that great, 
then consider that her glories were purchased, there's a price to pay, by valiant men and women who understood their responsibility and acted on their duty. So he basically says, if you really consider that we're one of the greatest cities there's ever been, the only reason we were great is because all of our citizens acted on their responsibility. So that just, that just solidified it for me. I got to figure out a way to get other people to take responsibility. Now look at below, you can read the full thing later, but look what this historian says. Pericles confronted the problem that faces any free or democratic society. How can the citizens be persuaded to make sacrifices necessary for success? Tyrants and dictators can rely on armies or the force, you know, I, I will kill you if you don't. But you can't do that in a society like this. Like, you can't go down the, down the road here, and there's somebody that's drunk every day who's not taking care of their kid, and you can't walk in there with a gun and say, if you don't get off the booze, I'm going to kill you, because you're ruining your kid's life, right? You can't do that. And neither could Pericles. No, but when you are that way, you feel that way. You do feel it, right? Yeah. So, but look at this. Democracies cannot use such devices. Instead, democratic leaders, in, uh, de democratic leadership involves a freer kind of public education. Pericles sought to teach the Athenians that their own interests were in alignment with those of the community and that they could not be successful without the community being successful. Okay, now take that and set that over here for just a second. What have we already decided in the last few weeks? We've decided that leadership isn't the same as it used to be. We've decided that people don't find titles to be impressive anymore. They're not impressed with authority. The fact is they reject authority today. So I'm not saying it's, it's in Pericles' time. I am saying that attitudes today take a freer kind of leadership. You're not going to be able to demand that a citizen gets in line. You're not going to be able to demand that a kid gets in line. You're not going to be able to demand that an employee gets in line. You're going to have to educate that kid, that citizen, that employee to show them how their interests are in alignment with the interests that you're doing. And once they see that, once they gain that alignment, then they're more willing to give their all. It's just like when you guys work with kids. The light bulb goes off in a kid's head when he realizes that you can help him reach his dreams. And sometimes, as you just said, sometimes you've got to help him realize or her realize that they're worth enough to have a dream because they've been beaten down by life so much. So sometimes the first step is just getting the kid to realize they're worth having a dream. Well, I'm a piece of crap. I'm not worth having a dream. You know, that's what they're... They say to themselves, mentally, maybe not out loud. So then you grow them to a place where they believe, well, you know what, I can have a dream. And then you help, them to, uh, help to show them that their dream can come true if they're responsible, hardworking, and the like. You're teaching responsibility. Well, the same, I think, is true in a town. Well, where's the historical precedence for that? Athens, the greatest city state in the history of mankind, because the leader of it said it was because people took their responsibility. So if we want to get the drugs out of Fort McMurray, then we've got to start teaching civic responsibility. Because the, the citizens, the citizens will run the drugs out of town. The community will run the drugs out of the neighborhood. You say, well, that can't be. Really? New Brunswick, we saw it in New Brunswick, we saw it in Vancouver, we saw it in every community that we've done these kind of playground projects. The citizens take back the community. They take their responsibility. Okay. So what we're going to teach over the next three weeks is, how do I get a person to take greater responsibility than they did the day before? How do I get a citizen to want to take greater ownership than they did the day before? How do I create Maria Amazolas? How do I get, how do I become the Pericles in my little corner of the world? And whether that's a youth worker, whether that's within RMWB, whether that's just being a citizen, how do I get people around me to take greater responsibility? Now we're going to focus on three areas. We're going to focus on three areas. The, the, the focus is going to be on you and your code of conduct. How do you operate your life? How do you get buy-in and building pride? Those are the three things we're going to talk about over the next three weeks. Today we're going to talk about a code of conduct and we're going to talk a little bit about pride and building pride. But before we do that, we always take a little survey. So go and we're going to take a little survey.
If you are this, then you're 10. If you're not this, then you're 1. If you're somewhere in between, circle. I'll read them randomly. You guys that are watching on the video, you do the same. Uh, I'll read them randomly, and then we'll get through them really quickly. I believe I have responsibility to my family, my employees, and my organization and community. Now, what's funny about that is we might think that that's kind of trite, but stop and think about it. Do you really believe that? Or are there some things that you know could be fixed, but you're ignoring? Because let's be honest, those ladies, the principal of the school at Fort Chip, I'm sure he's a nice man, but the principal at the school in Fort Chip, for how many ever months, either he just felt like there was nothing he could do, or he was talking to his hires up and nothing happened, but how many degrees with me? Unacceptable. I mean, come on, man. You're in charge. You're the leader, dude. Yeah. Get it fixed. Yeah. Okay, so, but there is a place, I can understand, I can be empathetic to this. There comes a point in time where you just say, I I've tried everything I can do. So you can't just walk by this. Do you really believe you're responsible? Because responsibility, the first step in responsibility is, I have the ability to respond. As opposed to, well, that's not my job, or I can't fix that. All right, I'll just keep reading. I believe that others are capable and have a right to make a decision that affects their situation. I believe that each person has knowledge, experience, and skills. What does that have to do with responsibility? See, when I discount someone's talent, I discount that they can be responsible. Well, that guy's too dumb to be responsible, so I'll just do it myself. Well, wait a minute. Do you believe people have potential or not? I actively value and seek diverse viewpoints and perspectives. I encourage everyone to contribute their, from, to their stakeholder group. I can get people to buy in. I understand the importance of values. I personally define issues as opportunities to motivate action. So when there's a problem, do we hunker back or do we say to ourselves, here's a chance to get people into action? I can build pride. I understand what it takes to gain buy-in and the process for doing so. I can mobilize other people. So for the next three weeks, we're going to learn how to be a catalyst for responsibility. In other words, we place a priority on engaging and in cultivating others taking ownership. Others taking ownership of their neighborhood, their life, whatever. In the case of the three ladies, we act as a catalyst for greater responsibility and look at what has already happened in just three weeks. Now, is that because of us? No, we were just the catalyst. The ingredients were already there, right? The ingredients were already there. That's the point of being a catalyst. The ingredients are already there. All right, turn the page. First, first part of this endeavor, first part of this exercise, what's a code of conduct? Young lady, what's a code of conduct? How you behave. How you behave. Code of conduct. Now, we've all heard that companies have code of ethics. Like, here's one for you. If, you've been, if any of you have been watching the news, it's interesting that our Senate has an unusual code of conduct. Right? We have certain senators that think you can turn in your seats and get money for things you didn't do to the tune of almost $100,000. $300,000. Now, the thing that drives me crazy, and I'm, I feel actually sad for this guy. I feel sad for Duffy. Because here's a guy that was a journalist, right? And everybody loved him in Canada. He was a good guy. And he was on TV every day. And he gets appointed to senator. And, well, you know, you kind of look at that and go, well, that was kind of weird. But, okay, we'll go with it. And then the next thing you know, he just starts doing stuff that's crazy. Starts saying he's doing certain things and in his, in, is saying he's in a place when he's in a completely different place. And not doing that once like it was a, a new, you know, an error. I, well, I meant to put it on line 11, but I put it on line 12. It is alleged, because we don't want to say anyone's guilty, right? We don't know. But it is alleged that what he did was, I am in Ottawa. Oh, I'm in Florida. I am in Ottawa. <laughs> I'm in London, Ontario. I just, I, uh, Ottawa, London, I don't know. It all kind of comes together. I was moving so fast. And if, I was outside the 100-kilometer area. Yeah. In order to claim all my expenses. All his expenses. $90,000. And in some of those that he submitted, he was in Florida. 
Now you stop and think about that. How does a guy get to a place where he's well-respected journalist to doing crazy stuff like that? Comfortable. Arrogance, comfort. I, I just know this. He must not have had a code of conduct. And if he had a code of conduct, what happened to it? It just kind of faded. What's your point, Ian? We've, we've heard so many stories like that today that we're not even surprised anymore. We're like, yeah, once you become a leader, man, you become a Yahoo, or you know, you take advantage of people, or you know, you're gonna, you're gonna get something for yourself, just kind of being a leader. And we long for people that are not like that, that are authentic and sincere and real. So how can we be that leader? Well, I think that, I think you gotta have a code of conduct that means something to you, and then you gotta follow it. Because we want leaders that we know we, we can expect from. There's a lot of talk about this word authenticity. You gotta be real. You gotta, you gotta be real, man. You gotta be real. You gotta be authentic. Well, what does that really mean? Well, to me, it means this. That you, here's what you say you are, and here's what you actually do. And that more times than not, what you say is what you do. Notice I didn't say all the time, because we're not perfect. Just more times than not. More hours, more days, more weeks, more, more months, more years than not. I am this, is what I say, and actually, it's what I do. Not every day, because I'm not going to be perfect. Not every month, not every year. Just more times than not. So what we're going to do now for the next little bit is we're going to do a little exercise. Now, some of you may have already created a code of conduct in your life. Now, maybe, maybe you created it like because you just started to live life a certain way, and that's how you live life. Or maybe you created it because you wrote it down. I don't know how you created it. But we're going to actually do an exercise to help you either, because you've created it before, revisit it, or if you've never done it before, create one, a code of conduct. Because I can't get somebody else to take responsibility if what? If I won't take responsibility. And I won't, I won't let you lead me if I don't think you have a code of conduct. What do you mean by that, Ian? Think about the leaders that you've let lead you. Not that you work for, that's different. Because a leader who I let lead me, I give my all to. I trust them explicitly. That's different than a person I work for. So I'm talking about a leader in your life that you gave your all to, you probably respected them. And if you respected them, you probably found them to be responsible. Because you wouldn't give them le that level of trust with your life if they were irresponsible. So a code of conduct, I think, is key. Now, a lot of times it's very complicated. And you go to all these gurus, and they've got all these exercises that you do. To, I just think it boils down to three questions. So I'm going to ask you three questions, and you're going to give three answers to three questions. And in the three answers to the three questions, you will create your code of conduct. Okay? First question. What are three values you hold dear, and how would I see that? So what are three things? So write them down. Three values that you hold dear. And if you're watching right now, the archive, three values you hold dear. Three values you hold dear. Three values you hold dear. Okay, three values. All right, who's brave enough to share one? Three values you hold dear. Okay, so for you, honesty is very, very, very important, right? Okay, now, can I pick on you a little bit? Because look at the second half of that question. Because it's not enough to say, this is my value. How would I see that? Okay, so that's a very practical. I do not spread rumors. Now, if somebody came to you and I was like, uh, hey man, did you hear about Ross? How would you respond to that? Uh, I have had that happen and I just yeah. I ask them to not do that. I, I just won't, I'll say right up front, I don't engage in gossiping. I'm uncomfortable. That's awesome. So if you didn't hear what she said, she said, I just look at them and say, I don't engage in gospel. gossip. I had someone say to me one time that this is what they do when they have that happen. They say, um, are you about to talk about so-and-so? And they're like, yeah, I got to tell you about it. And then they'll look at them and go, well, let's go get so-and-so and let's talk about it all together. That kind of shuts the gossip down real quick, right? Okay, so for her, gossip, honesty. No uh, honesty and no gossip, right? 
Okay, somebody else. A value that you hold dear. Something that's important to you. Ross? Um, Other than honesty. If I say I'm going to do something, I'll do it. Okay, so, so his thing is, my word is my bond. I will do that if I've told you that I'm going to do it. Okay? Where would, how would we see that in your day? Well, I was here a long time ago when I first came here. We had a meeting downstairs with Dolores and uh, the lady from Ottawa and I think Candace Black. Sherry? Sherry. Sherry. Yeah. And uh, I got invited and uh, she asked me to do something and, you know, first of all, I didn't know I was invited. I didn't even know this place existed. I don't know what they were doing. So, not hey. I'm in the community economic development and community development, so I came and she asked me to do something and I did it. And I wrote her an email and, and I CC'd uh, Shirley on, on it and they said, thanks, you know. And I saw them, I don't know, a couple weeks later, they were doing something else and I said, I said, you asked me to do something and I did it and she goes, well, we figured you would, we knew you would, but it was a bit of a test. But, but you know, we heard that you would get things done. And we we like people in the municipality who do that because we don't have a good track record with the other ones. Hmm. Very good. Now let me ask you a question. Do you have to have good time management skills to get things done? Well, okay. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. And, and do you have to... Uh, be focused on the task at hand to get things done. Yes, again. So here's my point. He's got a value that sounds very noble. I believe that my word is my bond. But to be able to deliver on that value, there's certain skills that have to back it up. Your situation. I believe in honesty. Now I'm assuming you mean you believe in honesty in your time, you believe in honesty in your work, you believe in honesty in all that you do. Well, wouldn't you agree there are certain skills that are necessary to be able to deliver that? So that's why the and and the words after that first are so important. And here's how you can see that in my life. Because if you can't translate the value into daily activity, then there's a big gap between what you say and what you do. And people will find you to be inauthentic. So, so even though it seems like a very simple exercise, well, what, what do you mean, what do I stand for, what do I value? Well, not what do you stand for, what do you value, just like in some conceptual way. But how do you back that up every day? So we gotta be really careful what we say what we value. Because I gotta talk to the people that work with you to find out what you really value, right? Because they'll see it in play. All right, let's do the next one. What are three things coworkers, friends, family, whatever, can absolutely expect from you? What can they absolutely expect from you? Okay. What are three things they can absolutely expect? Now, some, for some of you that are watching and some of you that are here, if I talk to your coworkers and friends and family, they would say this. You can absolutely expect them to be five minutes late. Or you can absolutely expect them to have a smart aleck remark when it's inappropriate. Right? Now, we're not saying what the ideal is. We're saying what the reality is. What, is, what can you absolutely guarantee? All right, who wants to share one? Devoted. Okay, so you're loyal. I put, um, devoted meaning like being, when I say I'm going to be here, I expect myself to be here and they should be able to expect me to be here. Open meaning like open for change, open for time their way, not just myself. Um, accountability, like I can create ownership on stuff and they can expect that from me and that I do deliver it. And willingness, the willingness to just try. That's awesome. So, those, those key things that people can expect, if you consistently deliver them, people are going to respect you. 
and if you can consistently deliver them people are going to even admire you they're going to find you to be responsible and you know what when you're able to do that consistently over a period of time people are going to let you lead them why because they know what they can expect from you all right somebody else give me one somebody else give me one trust so people can absolutely expect trust from you phenomenal leadership quality if you consistently over a period of time do that with people around you they will let you lead them they will let you speak into their life because they feel safe enough to let you do so because they can trust you like for me i put i put hard work creativity energy you can guarantee you're going to get energy you're going to guarantee you can get problem solving and i'll try to work hard now i might not be the nicest guy in the world i might not be the kindest guy in the world I might not be the friendliest guy in the world, because sometimes I'm not. But you can guarantee I'll work hard. You can guarantee I'll bring energy every day to every situation I'm in. And you can guarantee I'll be creative. I'll try to problem solve. I'll try to find a way to win. Why am I asking you to do this proactively? Why am I asking to, you to identify the things that people can guarantee from you before you begin? So you can learn to accept what they're expecting. Okay. Okay. Why else? That's a good point. Why else? Looking at yourself in the mirror and seeing that part of you being truthful in yourself. True. Very good. There's one more thing. One more reason why I'd, I would I'd ask you to look in yourself and then say, I can deliver this. Notice I didn't say friendly. Why didn't I say friendly? Because what do I know about me? I'm not always friendly. I'm not even always nice. Because I'm just not. I'm, I'm just not. It's not my character. If I think there's an injustice, I'm not going to be nice. If I think that you, you know, are being mean to people, I'm not going to be friendly. I just not, you will not guarantee that from me. So one of the reasons I'm asking you to look at it proactively is asking yourself, what can I deliver on? Disney. Why is Disney so great? Fun. How old you are, how young you are, it's fun. Now why, why is that though? Because you know what you're getting every single time. Or at least nine times out of ten. So they have a code of conduct as an organization. And they have said, hey customers, here's what you can expect. The magic wonderland. And you go there and you go, wow, this is magic wonderland. This is pretty cool. From the restaurants to the uniforms to the music to the games to the rides to the everything is magic wonderland all the way down to the end detail. McDonald's. Now I'm not saying I'm a big McDonald's fan. But you know what? You go anywhere in North America and order a Big Mac, even though it's not very big anymore. If you order a Big Mac, what do you get? You know what you're going to get. And it's pretty damn consistent. Like this, Timmy Hortons. You get a cup of Timmy Hortons coffee just about anywhere even down in the States, and you know what you're going to get. And that's why there is a flipping line around in the drive-thru 24 hours a day, it seems like. Why? Because you know what you're going to get. Loyalty to a company brand comes from, here's what our advertising says we are. I go and do it, and I get that or more. So I become loyal to the brand. Loyalty to a leader, here's what I say I am. And then more times than not, the followers get that. Or it's so consistent, you want more. Because let's be honest, McDonald's not always that great. But you know what you're going to get. But it's consistent. And so when you pay $349 for something, you get $349 worth. What does that mean from a leadership standpoint? Well, I want, I want to be able to say what I know I can deliver on. So the reason I'm asking you to do it proactively is don't set up an unrealistic expectation. So notice I didn't say that I was always going to be, you know, notice I, I didn't say I, I wouldn't drop the ball. Because you know what? I drop the ball sometimes on things. I, I just do. I just drop the ball. Now that could be forgetfulness. That could be that I'm juggling too many balls. Who knows why? But every once in a while I drop the ball on something. So... I'm not going to say that I can deliver on that. So the reason I'm saying, I'm asking you to do this proactively is, look within yourself and say, can I deliver this nine times out of ten? Because it says, absolutely expect from me. 
So don't set up an un, unrealistic expectation. So, so much of leadership is expectation management. So much of getting kids to participate in something is managing their expectations. So much of getting other organizations to part with, partner with RMWD is managing expectations. How many times, and Ross or you have probably heard, well, we expected RMWB to do whatever. Somehow they got a bad expectation. So we don't want to set that up for followers. All right, let's look at the next one. Three things that you absolutely will not tolerate. What are three things that, you know what, I just don't put up with that. I will not tolerate that. What are three things you will not tolerate? Whatever. Just three things you will not tolerate. Because this code of conduct isn't just for work, right? It's life. Yeah, it's life. Obviously, allegedly, let me say that. I want to say obviously. Allegedly, Senator had some different codes of conduct in different situations. He had situational conduct codes, right, Tim? Tim is a leadership guru. He would tell you that situational conduct code, probably not always the best. Okay, somebody share one with me. What's that? Okay, give us one of your four. I'll be ethical. Okay. Right. And as a worker, I don't like the non involvement. Not not being involved. If someone won't involve you. Or involve themselves. Okay. That's good. That's good. And what did you say? Not getting it. So you don't tolerate people that are not getting it done. That's awesome. Do you have one? Yeah, negativity. Negativity. You won't tolerate that. Did you have one? Okay. Yeah. And here's one for me. Injustice. I, I just don't tolerate that. I have, no, I have very, very little tolerance for injustice. When I know that people are knowingly, when I'm aware that people are knowingly treating other people wrong, I don't have a lot of time for that. That's why I said what I said about the principle of fortune. Come on now. If you, if you don't get fired, you should push. You should just say, I screwed, I screwed this up. I should walk out. I should, I'm done. Yeah, right? I mean, I, I met him. He's a good guy. But, but obviously, thumbs up. Something's up. If you can't, you can't. I tell them straight up. I've done it, and I still do it. It's because it's the kids that are, you know, and it's sad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it's not only sad. You could, all, you could almost say that it, and I'm not speaking of this in the Fort Chip situation, so let me be clear because obviously this is on tape. So I'm not speaking, when I say this, I'm not speaking to the Fort Chip situation. But situations where adults don't follow through or don't do the best for the kid is almost immoral. That's what I think about. I think about that little boy who really has to go to the bathroom. It's going to be an inappropriate example, but who really has to go to the bathroom really, really bad, but also wants to stay in school really, really bad. And he's got to make a choice between walking down the street to his house and going to the bathroom and staying in school. I mean, that's just, why is a, a, a seven-year-old having to make that choice in one of the richest countries in the world? We say, well, Fort Chips is not one of the richest communities in the world. Well, let me tell you, they can turn on the water. They can build a wall or the school, Northland School Board, right? I mean, come on. It's like they come here for games, they come here for activities, they come here, trust us, they come here for this, and it's like, we want to play baseball. Well, we don't have a ball. You're shooting your shit down. No, you go find a ball. Uh, and maybe you say, I don't have a ball today, but I will have a ball for you when you come back, right? I'll get you a ball. But between now and the next time you come, I'll try to get you a ball. Right? And that's, I mean, that's what you guys do with this playground. Right? A beautiful playground. Gorgeous playground. 
And so you guys have said, you, when I say you guys, I mean you and the community have said, we're going to make sure our kids have the best. Now, we don't have a paved road, but our kids are going to have the best. That's the thing that's always ironic to me when I come to this town. I, I, dr I drive on dirt, and then I come to a playground that's as good as any playground in North America. Really. I mean, the only thing that would be different for a better playground is you might have more bigger. But you don't have any less equipment. You have the finest equipment, the highest end equipment of any playground in North America, but you ain't got a road. But that, you know what that tells me? Priorities. If we have limited resources, we're going to put them into our kids and their development. That's, that's something to be proud of, right? So obviously, one of the values of the community, or at least some members of the community, is take care of the kids. All right, so what have we just done? Well, we just created a code of conduct. You just made, you didn't have to do some new facilitative exercise. You didn't have to write a mission statement. You didn't have to do anything. You really answered the three questions that matter. What do I value and how would you see it? That's question number one. What are three things you can absolutely guarantee for me? And then what are three things I just won't tolerate? Those are your, that's your code of conduct. But we do have to be cautious about something. Cautious. You guys know my wife's name is Jean. So one time when I was coming to Fort McMurray, I landed. And I literally, as soon as I turned on my cell phone, the phone was ringing. And it was Gina. And I said to her, hey, what's going on? I just landed. She's like, silence. And man, you know, problem. So she says, uh, uh, did you change the light bulb in the garage? Now, you immediately know what that means. No, obviously I didn't. Because you wouldn't ask it like that if I had. And so I'm scrambling in my mind. Uh, no. And, and it was actually before I could say the word no, she says, no, of course you did. You left before it needed to be changed. And how do I know that? And without me being able to respond? Because I just went out there, it was dark, I couldn't turn on the light, and I cut my shin. And you know what I cut my shin on? That rusty bike that I told you to move for the last two and a half years. And how many of you know, then came all of the things that I have left undone for the last 13 years of marriage. Right? Everything. If you don't have the fire thing, and you didn't do this, and one, when the babies were one year old, and you didn't do that, you left them in the car, and it was running, and like, just like, and how many of you know I was like, yes, honey, yes, honey, yes, honey, right? And then I said this, when, when, when all the wind came out of that balloon, I said, but honey, you knew I was scrambling to get out the door. I was late because of a call. I was trying to get to the airport. I intended to go and buy that at home, those light bulbs at Home Depot. I just didn't get on there. I didn't get it. I didn't get on the ladder. I didn't do it. I'm sorry. I had all of the right intentions of doing it. And then she says, well, that's great. But for the next three days, we'll have no light in the garage. Because I'm five foot two, and even if I stand on the tallest ladder at the top, I cannot reach. What's your point here? My point is, I was asking her to judge me on my intentions. She was judging me on my, what I delivered, my actions. Okay, now I, I get to the hotel, I get out of the cab, United cab, I get out, I go into the hotel, I check in, so I hang up with Gina, I go in, I get in my room, and there's no heat. So I go over to the thermostat thing, and I'm hitting the thermostat thing, and there's no heat. And it's freaking cold. It is cold, right? It's winter's night, Fort McMurray cold. So I'm like, nee, 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 and call the front desk. Hey, how are you? Hey, it's Ian Hill up here in room, whatever, and I got no heat. Oh, yeah, she says. We are having some problems with some of the units. Seems to be electrical, da 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 We are working on it. Okay, cool. We're working on it. I'll just keep my jacket on. Freezing, turn on the TV. You know, here we go. So, so literally an hour and a half later, still nobody, no engineering, no, just cold. Call. Hello, front desk, I'm about to go to bed, but I'm freezing my you-know-what off. I need some heat. And she says, well, you know, we're trying to really work on that. We're trying to get to that. We're trying to help with that. You know, blah, 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 blah. And I look at her. Uh, you know how much you're charging me for this room? You know, Hang up the phone. And I took a step back, and I was like, wow. 
Here I was, literally an hour and a half earlier, begging my wife to cut me some slack and judge me on my intention. And I'm ripping this girl at the front desk a new one, judging her on her actions. So one of the challenges with this code of conduct is, for it to be the real deal, you can't judge yourself on your intentions. And that's really a big step in leadership. Like Tim and I and Ross were just at lunch, and there was a thing that happened, right? Tim, right? There was a thing that happened. It doesn't really matter what the thing that happened was. But a thing happened. And I, you know, I gave my two cents. But ultimately, the person responsible, the person who is in charge, the person who has to accept ownership of the failure of that thing is me. It's not the people who did the thing. Well, certainly they have to accept some responsibility. But ultimately, I'm responsible. Because I didn't create the conditions. I didn't clarify the system. Remember we talked about before. You know, ultimately, leaders are responsible for the poor performance of followers. Right? So ultimately, I was responsible for that. Now the tough part is when you start judging yourself exclusively on your actions, it's a high bar, man. It's not easy. Now I didn't notice I didn't say beat myself up based on my actions. I didn't say, let that little voice in my head dominate your piece of junk. Look, you always screw things up. I didn't say that. I said, step up and say what I said to Tim. And what did I say in the truck, Tim? He said, you know what? It's my fault. That is exactly what I said. It's my fault. I'm the leader. I should have done this, this, and this. It would have corrected the issue. There, they were, the, there was a void of leadership, so people just acted. They didn't really, you know, they just said, well, no one else is doing it. Let's do it. And how can you blame them for that? That's good initiative. My fault as a leader, period. So the tough part about a code of conduct is, one, the creation, two, the living, and three, the judging. So are you saying you know, we should be our biggest critics? Notice, I'm not saying beat yourself up. I'm not saying attack yourself. I'm not saying demean yourself. I'm not saying any of those things. I'm just saying your evaluation matrix should be based exclusively on action, not intention. Because, why does anybody, why is that? Good, why else? What are your followers judging you on? Not your intentions. They're judging you on your performance. So then we might as well judge ourselves that way. We might as well. Now, is that a high bar? It is a high bar. And will we always do it? No, we will not. But I would rather shoot for the stars and hit the moon. Right? I'd rather set the high bar, strive for it, than set the low bar and consistently hit it. Okay, code of conduct. Now, if you're watching this via video or if you're sitting here, I, I really would encourage you to go back and think about this one. What do I stand for as a leader? What do I value? What, what can people guarantee for me? What will I not tolerate? And then the most important question of that is how do people see that? And what you're going to find is many of the skills that we've talked about are what allow you to be able to deliver that thing consistently. Time management, delegation, motivation, all of those things, implementing change, all of the things that we've talked about will allow you to be consistent as a leader. All right, flip the page. Okay, to be a catalyst for responsibility, we've got to be able to get buy-in. How do we get buy-in from people? So tell me, give me, can you toss me a bottle of water, Tim? Somebody tell me, how do you get somebody to buy in now? What do you do now to get somebody to buy in? Thank you very much. What do you do? Like, you got, you got a new thing you want to try. You got a new policy. You got a, you got a new game that you want to play with the kids. Or you got a new program you want to do. How, right now, do you take me through the steps you use to get somebody to buy in? Okay, so explain what it is. Hey, everybody, you're doing this. And here's why it can be good for you. And I hope you all buy in. Okay, it's good. Anybody else? Anything to add to that? Is there anything you do that you would add to that? What's that? Okay, so one, explain. Two, give the benefit and then role model. Right? Perfect. You explain it, you explain it but then you go do it. Okay, anybody, anything to add to, to those three things? What's that? Encourage them. So, so what, as they're trying it, you're selling, hey, you can do it. Come on now, I'm staying in there. Don't quit. You can make it. I know it's hard at the beginning, but go for it. Okay.
Okay, so let's look. That's probably a pretty good sequence. Explain what it is, then explain why it's valuable to them, demonstrate it, or role model it, do it yourself, and then encourage them as they do it. Pretty good. So I wanted to figure out, kind of like you guys, man, why don't people just buy into whatever I'm selling? Why is it always a freaking struggle, man? Why? What's that? What's that? You gotta promote it, yeah. But I always ask myself, why is it that people go like this? Right? Why don't they go like this? Yeah! Whatever you wanna do, let's do it. Yay! Why is it always like pulling teeth to get people to do things? Buy in. So I came across the writings of a guy named Dr. Ludwig. And Dr. Ludwig was out of the University of Texas down in the States. And he had done all this exploration, all this study on what were the key ingredients to getting community members. He was working on community members. How do you get people in a neighborhood to buy into the new thing that the town is doing? Or buy into the thing the neighborhood is doing? Or buy in? How do you do that? And he, he, he came down to three ingredients. He boiled it down to three key ingredients. Now, from now on, whenever you do something new, whenever you try something out of the ordinary, whenever you want to implement a new policy or get a new group involved or you want to do something new with the kids, I want you to ask yourself three questions because they were the three questions he said needed to be asked before you start anything or you want to get people to buy it. The first question he said you had to ask was, is it relevant? Is the thing that you want to do relevant to that group and how would you explain it? Kind of like what you said. I would explain it. But oftentimes when we go to explain it, they still don't buy it. Probably because we didn't ask the question from their standpoint. We didn't say, if I was them, what part of this would make me say it's relevant to me? And what does relevant mean? Relevant means I think it applies to me. So oftentimes we have something that's good for another group or another person. But they don't see that it is because we haven't explained it from their point of view, from their perspective. They think, oh, it's just going to be more work for us. Or, oh, this is going to be harder for us. Oh, you just want to do this because you want to you control me. That's my daughter, my little 10-year-old. You are not allowed to get your ears pierced. Why? Everyone else has ears pierced. You're not allowed to do it. She says, why is that? Because you can't clean your room. You don't take care of your stuff. Well, that's pretty mean, Dad. No, I know you won't keep your ears clean. I know you won't twist those little new things. I just know you. You're not ready for that. And so you're, if you do, if I get your ear turned, your ear is going to be this big in a month because it's going to be infected. So guess what we do? We got her ears turned. And how long did it take before her ear was this big? About three weeks. Her, seriously, her ear was like this big. And so badly I wanted to pop that. <laughs> it's so gross. <laughs> My wife's like, get away from her ear. <laughs> Typical guy, right? What did I know? I knew that she wasn't ready. And I hadn't explained my decision from her perspective. But trust me, as soon as that thing started to blow up, as soon as it started to get infected, she understood the relevance of my comment. So when you go to implement a new thing, when you go to implement a new thing, say, how will we explain the relevance to that stakeholder group? In a language, in a style, in an approach that they will understand. Second, impact. I've got to be able to demonstrate the impact to them. Now, if you remember when we talked about communication, we said that there was four communication styles. Does anybody remember them? What were the four communication styles? Remember there was fact-based? What was the other one? Emotion-based? Value-based? Starts with a B. Belief based, very good. So when I go to explain impact, I have to explain it in each one of those methods. So we got to get rid of drugs in the community. And everybody's like, well, okay, why does that matter to me? I don't do drugs. And nobody in my neighborhood does drugs. It's all those people over there who do drugs. So what do I care about drugs? Well, the fact is that it costs all of us an extra million dollars a year. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, hold on now. Cost me a million dollars? I don't even live over there. Well, it costs you some of that million dollars. The fact-based communicator is going to pay attention. 
impact. Well, see all those people doing drugs over there? Yeah, but that's not me. And that's not my family or my neighborhood. Yeah, but it's ruining their lives. It's destroying them. Look, here's a picture of what they look like after they've been on crystal meth for a year. Oh, emotion, right? Oh, well, that's wrong. That's no good. Or how about this? See those people over there that are doing drugs? It's ruining their lives. Oh, that doesn't affect me. I'm not even on, I'm over here. We're on the good side of town. Everything's fine. Yeah, but don't you value people's lives? Isn't life important to you? And doesn't it sadden you that people's lives are being destroyed? Oh, yeah. My values say I'd never want that. So, <clears throat> to get that person who doesn't even live in the bad neighborhood to buy in, I'd better be willing to communicate it in various ways. Because if all I do is show the picture of what a person looks like when they look like a, sh a, sh you know, a shrunk apple, the fact-based communicator looks like that, and he looks at him and goes, ah, tough luck for them. Until I start talking to him about the cost of that. Then the fact-based communicator is like, uh, okay, hold on. That cost me how much? Or if I just give the numbers to the emotion-based communicator, what are they going to say? Well, those numbers don't mean anything. So one of the reasons that we don't get buy-in is because we only communicate in one way the impact. Have you ever seen a commercial where you see, you know, a, 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 have you seen that commercial with the animals and it's Sarah McLaughlin's song? Oh, man. It's very emotional, right? But you and I both know the fact-based communicators like, okay, change the channel. Whereas emotional-based communicators like me were like, oh, get the credit card. Let's make a donation right now. And then, of course, my wife, who's a fact-based communicator, is like, use your own credit card. <laughs> Gina Hill, the Minister of Finance. Anyway, so that's one of the reasons why we don't get, we don't effectively communicate impact is because we forget of the different communication styles. And then finally, quality. Now, this is a funny thing. When we go to implement something, well, let me, let me say it another way. Have you ever been involved in an organization that tries to implement things. And then they implement it, but they never stick with it. So they implement it, and then a year later you're like, what ever happened to that thing that everybody was all fired up about? Or a community initiative. We're going to be a green community. Green community. Woo, green or whatever. We're going to do it. It's going to be great. Signs, posters, big kickoff, news conference. Yeah, woo! A year and a half later. Hey, what happened to that green community thing? Right? And then citizens go like this. Okay, here we go. The next thing. Like, I know for a fact, within RMWB, guarantee you, a year and a half ago, everybody was like, okay, yeah, great. Louis should be camp. Here we go. Glenn obviously was, Glenn's the head of RMWB. Glenn obviously went to some conference and met somebody. Here we go. So he's bringing them to town. Right? Am I, am I right, Tim? Everybody was like, what is this leadership boot camp thing? Because it's going to be just like the other seven things that have come along and never finish and they never do. And okay, great. So we as leaders have to recognize that followers won't buy in because they've been burned before. Followers won't buy in because they've been disappointed before. Followers won't buy in because we didn't finish the thing before. So what they really want to say to you is this. Look. I want the place to be better too. But we do all these gyrations and we go through all these new programs and nothing ever comes out of it. So why do you want me to buy into this thing? So what I mean by quality is this. Before we roll out the new thing, we got to say, have our past things been of quality? Because nobody will buy into something that's not of quality. So if we have a track record or a history of quality, they're more likely to buy in. If we have a track record or history of no quality or poor quality, I say this, no thank you. Even if I say it attitudinally, which will look something like this, which means no thank you. Okay, so what do I do? What do you think you do if that's the case? How do I handle it? Do I just give up and say, well, you know what, we've been crappy before, so no one's going to buy in. What do you think you do? Which is a good idea, except what do people always remember? 
right. So here's what I would, although that's a good idea, but human nature is always going to remember all the bad things you did, right? So, so here's what I would suggest you do. The first thing you do is stand up and say what everybody's already thinking. I know all of you are probably saying this leadership boot camp thing is like all the other seven leadership things that have come down the road. And I can understand why you would say that. Well, automatically the followers go like this. What? Did they just admit what all of us were thinking? Okay, let me pay attention here because this is different. And then you say all of the things that you are doing differently to make sure that mistake doesn't happen again. So, two things you do. One, you openly admit what everybody's already thinking. And then two, you tell them what you are doing differently to make sure that problem doesn't happen again. What does that force you to do? What are you forced to do? To be responsible. What else is it forced to do, young lady? Think now. I've had to identify why things didn't work in the past, and I've had to come up with a plan to overcome those. And then I've, I've got to then go explain that to the stakeholders I want to do it with. What does that set you up for? Yeah. It probably gives you a greater likelihood of better implementation. And as I get better and better at implementing new things, are the followers more likely to buy in as I implement new things? Yes or no? Yes. So it self-perpetuates. So when do I ask myself these questions? I ask myself these questions before I ever begin. So it would end up being all the time if I'm always, right, moving things forward. So I'm, and why am I asking before I begin? Gosh, how are we going to explain to them how it's relevant to them from their perspective? Gosh, how are we going to be able to explain to the four kind of communicators the impact that they will have through the communication style that they would better un most understand it? And wow, have we been of poor quality in the past and how are we going to overcome that? Or at least explain to them we're going to overcome that. What would that force out of me? Or what would be the positive benefit of asking those three questions every time I implement them? Okay, success out of everything you try, what else? You would see if it was worth doing before ever talking about it. So it forces you to have a plan, which makes you more likely to get buy-in from people in, in the future and so on and so forth, right? So at the end of the day, if you really want to get buy-in, it's not about slick Facebook pages, it's not about slick websites, it's not about any of those things. It's about just asking three simple questions and then making sure that with those three simple questions you follow through. Um, hi guys, how are you? You can come in, you can walk around, you can do whatever. You can be on camera too if you'd like. No, you're with um, So, on, on, uh, not on this Monday, but I think the following Monday, I'm going to set on the, that video that will come out on the Monday. We'll, we'll drill into just the whole buy-in procedure. Because we just set up the framework of what the questions you would ask yourself beforehand. But then what do you do after? So, okay, and I asked those questions, but now what do I go to do? And we'll walk you through some steps of what you go to do and how you go do it. How do you deliver the message? How do you listen to the message? How do you listen to the, to the response to the message? How do you overcome those barriers? What do you do as I now go try to implement the plan that was forced out of asking myself those three questions? Okay? All right, turn the page. Okay, a few more minutes. A few more minutes. And for those of you that are watching the archive, a few more minutes. You can watch hockey in a minute. Watch the playoff game in a second. All right. Remember we were talking about earlier that, that magic force, right? What's that magic force that makes a guy clean his yard? What's that magic force that makes the student stay up a little bit later to get the homework done? What's that magic force that made Maria Amazola, one of my employees, kill herself, not kill, but, you know, bust her butt every day to make sure the room was clean. Yeah, could be. What's a, what's a word? 
a word that we throw around a lot. It starts with a P. Pride. Pride. So let me read this. Pride is an intangible force that drives human capital unlike any other. Investing time and energy into both building organizational and individual pride will provide greater dividends than any other tool in a leader's toolkit. Building organizational pride will lead to higher morale, increased participation in problem solving, and a sense of ownership that creates a, a department or a community as a reflection of me attitude. Building individual pride leads to exceeded job expectations, greater ownership of employee specific tasks, and greater uh, the employee regularly innovates, and the, le the workplace is less stressful. Now, of course, that quote is from an incredible leader. Well, that's what I'm going to get All right, anyways. Now, take that quote and lay it over the top of the community. Why is there some communities where everybody cleans their yard, and there's some community communities where nobody cleans their yard? Why is there some communities where everybody takes care of their kids, and then there's other communities where nobody takes care of their kids? And you could say, well, it's socioeconomic, it's cultural, it's all these things. But you know what? I've been in some of the poorest places in the world, and people take care of their stuff. And I've been in some of the most affluent places in the world, and people don't take care of their stuff. Or they hire somebody to take care of their stuff. Self-pride community pride. Self-pride community pride. So what I think we as leaders, all of us, all of the people that are watching the archive, I think it's in our best interest to know how to take and create pride. Instill pride, cultivate pride, and deploy pride. Because pride really is a magic force. When you see pride, you can't touch it, but you can see it. What do you see? When you see someone who's proud of their work, not arrogant, now not false pride, but what do you, when you see pride in action, what, what do you get? What's the product of that? Mm. Do you see people come in early and stay late if they take pride in their job? Yeah? Do you see a parent who will sacrifice for their kid when they take pride in their family? Do you see citizens who come out and clean up the trash and the wherever if they take pride in their cleanup? So see, we spend a lot of time working on a whole bunch of stuff when if we worked on building pride, all that other stuff would take care of itself. If a person has pride in who they are, if a person has pride in their family, if a person has pride in their community, so many of those things take care of themselves. So I think it's in our best interest to know how to build pride. Now the funny thing is, the funny, not funny ha-ha, but maybe the ironic thing is we've lost that art. We used to know how to build national pride or community pride. And whether it was a monument, a castle, whether it was a crest on a shield, or whether it was a nation, right? We were proud to be aligned with or connected with that thing. Not much anymore. Not much anymore. Now, how about this? Have you seen companies that take great pride? Like, people are proud to work for that company. Well, you know, maybe an Apple or a Microsoft or Nike or something like that. Or maybe teams, athletic teams. There's athletic teams that every year are successful over and over and over and over. And when you become a part of that team, it seems like every player gets better just being a part of that team. Or maybe a community. People want to be a part of that community. Or a university. McMaster's, Queens, whatever. They have a reputation of being great. And so when you go there, you just get better. So could we as community leaders create that sense in a community? I think you can. I think there are some skills that can be utilized. And what is the result? Less crime, higher graduation rate, less teen pregnancy, less drugs, all because we focused on building pride. So, pull out this sheet right here. This sheet right here. So, I created this, or we created this flow chart to build pride. Step by step, just like if you were building a shed. How do you build pride? Now, not today, but this coming week, you're going to get four emails. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, on building pride. But, but I want to, and, and you'll notice that we'll go through each one of these steps. Because there's two kinds of pride. There's organizational or community pride, and then there's individual pride. Well, I don't understand you. How can they be different? How many of you know someone who's proud of their job and hate who they work for? 
You know what I mean? Like they're proud of their own work, but they don't like the company. So that's two different things. Or they're proud of them, their home and their family, but they're not proud of their community. So those are two very different, distinct sets or kinds of pride. Pride me, pride us. And I think you need to have both, and you need to have a strategy to build both. As I talk to mayors, as I talk to community members, as I talk to leaders in Ottawa and the like, they always ask me, Ian, what do you think? You've, you've done projects in 160 communities across the country, all very, very successful. What do you think? And I say this, the one thing we're not building in our communities is pride. We're not intentionally and proactively building community pride. We're not drawing people together and, and, and giving them a shared vision, helping them create a shared vision, a shared experience, a shared victory. So those are three keys now. Shared vision, shared experience, shared victory. Let me ask you this. All the kids that remember a long time ago, one of the first times I came here, we talked about that playground, we talked about fundraising, we talked about all those things, right? And then you guys had a plan, you were rolling, and you knocked that out in literally weeks. You raised the money, you eventually built that, and now a year later, it's open and ready to roll, right? We're the kids and we're the community and we're all of you involved proud of what you've done. Absolutely, right? Lots of pride. And I'll tell you why. Shared vision, shared experience, shared victory. Shared vision, shared experience, shared victory. You know what's funny? We don't have those anymore. See, in the past, we used to regularly have a shared vision. Hey, we need a new ball field, or hey, we need a new place to worship, or hey, we need a new whatever. And then we all looked at each other and went, okay, well, let's do it. Shared experience. We had a shared vision. Hey, let's do. And then we had a shared experience. You put in some wood. I put in some money. You put in some sweat. You baked. And we all came together and we did it. That was the shared experience. And then when it was done, we all went like this. Wow, look at that. Look, that's pretty good. Hey, good job. Hey, good job. Pride. Pride can only be built shared vision, shared experience, shared victory. Well, as soon as we started to get more and more civilized and somebody else started doing stuff for me, somebody else built my road, somebody else built my building, somebody else built my church or my place of worship, somebody else built my ball field, somebody else did everything for me. All I did was drive to work and drive home, go into my house. All of a sudden, no shared vision. All of a sudden, no shared experience. All of a sudden, no shared victory. All of a sudden, no community, what? Pride. How do you make something that has never been done before? Done? Like, you want things to have, like, say, the playground, for example, you're trying to share the vision, and you're not getting buy-in from, there was no good thing before, so there's nothing, like, how do you get, when you're starting to think, Okay, so you asked a very specific question, so I'll take you through a very specific answer, okay? So first of all, you're going to work with what I call a self-selected early adopter. So self-selected, what does that mean? That means I have this burning thing in my heart, this vision that I have. Let's use the playground. I got a playground in my heart, and I know the kids need it, I know it's valuable, and so on. So what I'm going to do is informally start to cast that vision. Hey, Ross, what's going on? Will play with me. Hey, Ross, what's going on? Okay, shorten up your lines, bro. We're not, this is the Academy Award. All right, this is, this is, this is just, short it up. All right. Hey, you know what, man? I was up in Fort McMurray the other day. They got a brand new playground up there, and I was down in Edmonton two weeks ago. They got a brand new playground there. And you know what? Our kids have to cry. And I just know that our kids deserve the best, too. I think we should have a playground. Now, he's either going to lean forward, lean forward, and say, yeah, you know what? I think they do. Or he's going to do this. Or he's going to do this. Did you watch the hockey game last night? Which, what does it tell me about him? Not him. So then I go to her and I say, hey, I was in Fort McMurray the other day, and I was in Edmonton. Our kids deserve the best, and I think we should build a playground. And she looks at me and she says, be very positive. That's a great idea. I just got a self-selected early adopter. So what I'm going to do is informally go through town, and I'm going to cast my little vision. And I'm going to make a mental note of all the people that gave me positive body language or that were open to what I had to say. I got my little mental list. 
Then I'm going to make a list, as we talked about before, of the people of influence. Now, you asked me a very specific question, so I'm going to give you very specific steps. I'm going to make my list of the people of influence in town. The business owner, the spiritual leader, the elected official, or just the mom with the loudest mouth. Right? The people of influence. And I'm going to go to them if I can, if I have access to them, and I'm going to cast my little vision of them and see how they respond. So now I've talked to John Q. Public to see how they feel about it, and I've talked to the influ people of influence to see how they feel about it. And I have a list of the people that had a positive reaction. Next thing I'm going to do is go learn everything I possibly can about that thing. I'm going to get on the internet, and I'm going to take 20 minutes a day, and I'm going to learn everything I can about that thing. How do, you, how do you do that thing? Where have they done that thing? What are the roadblocks to doing that thing? What are the ups? What are the downs? What are the ins? What are the outs? And I'm going to take out of that list some people that I trust and know. And I'm going to invite them to my house. And I'm going to say, remember that thing? Maybe it's three of us. Remember that thing I told you about a couple weeks ago where it was really on my heart to build this playground? And you're going to be like, oh, yeah, okay, what? Well, I've been doing some research. I've been doing some looking, and I've been doing some finding, and I've been doing some education, and I actually think we can pull it off. And then you're going to explain why you think that. And remember the four styles of communication. I'm going to have to have some facts. I'm going to have to have a little bit of emotion in it. I'm going to have to have some belief and have some values. And I'm going to communicate it to the four people that I trust, and then I'm just going to see how they react. Two of the four are going to go like this. That is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It'll never happen. And two of the four are going to say, I'm in. And that's who you start with. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, once I start with them, I don't go and tell the whole town. I don't go invite everybody. I don't ask everybody to show up to the meeting. I don't do that. And notice I didn't go for the mayor or the, the spiritual leader. I, didn't, I just go for people who understood it. Self-selected early adopters. That's who I'm going for. I'm not worrying about anybody else. Okay, now i got to build the next community. You asked me a very specific question. You're going to regret this. Okay, because it's going to be a little long-winded. So, now i got to build the next concentric circle. So, what does that mean? So, i got my little core group of three or four, whatever it is. But notice, i got three or four people who get it. They understand it. I didn't have to convince them. I had one conversation, and then I showed them some facts and some examples, and they were in. We're in. Okay? You get it. We're, we're our little core group. Now what are we going to do? Now the four core of us are going to have that same conversation again. Well, why would we do it again? You've got your own sphere of influence you hang around with. You've got your own sphere of influence you hang around with. You've got your own sphere of influence you hang around with, and so do I. Now there might be some overlap in that. That is true. But you probably have some friends I don't have. You probably know some people I don't know. Now go talk to them. So we're going to take the next month and do the same thing. You're going to walk up and say, hey, at a playground, and blah, 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 and what do you think? Our kids deserve the best. And three and eight and ten people are going to be like, whatever. But two are going to be like, hey, what? Hey, what? Hey, what? Yeah, me too. I think the same. And then we'll have our first meetings. So now we've got this group of eight or ten. And what do we know about those eight or ten people? Why do I know they're committed? Because you talked to them and they bought the idea and they liked it. It wasn't a hard sell job. They said, I like it. They understood it from the beginning. With no, no tangible, it's already happening, no real plan, in their heart, it resonated with them. That's who I'm going to work with. I'm not going to work with somebody I have to convince right away. Eventually, I'll get the leader. Eventually, I'll get the spiritual leader. Eventually, I'll get all those guys because they always want to be involved with the winner. So don't worry about the prominent people. Remember, we always talk about the people of influence and the people of prominence. Don't worry about the prominent people. They'll always show up. The left-handed governor always shows up to our projects, whether he was in or she was in with the project or not. Why? Because they want to be involved with the project that's highly successful, right? No community official or community leader wants to be in doesn't want to be involved in a great community project. There's nobody. Nobody's going to be like, well, there's a thousand people showing up and it was highly successful. Through that, I'm not showing up. Rarely will that happen. So you'll get them on board later, but don't worry about them now. Now, if they want to be on board from the beginning, if they're a self-selected early adopter, then. so what have I got? I've got eight to ten pretty committed people that I can probably trust because they're on board. Now what do I do? Now together we begin to build a real plan. Now we can build a real plan. And we can do the research and we can do the investigation and we can do those things. Well, when do I go tell it to the rest of the community? Not till I have a real plan. 
not till I have some insight and some wisdom and some, some investigation and some, you know, some, some research that I've done. Remember we talked about go to the internet for 15 minutes a day and go study. Google it for 15 minutes a day and learn everything you possibly can. And then when you see a community that's done it well, call them. Don't just read about them. Call them. Hey, hi, I'm out here in John VA. Where? Oh, don't worry about it. It's in Alberta. Just, just help me out here. I notice what you're doing there in Alabama. I notice what you're doing there in Ontario. I notice what you're doing there in Australia. In your little rural community. Tell me all about it. Well, you know, blah, 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 blah. I'll even send you some stuff. Okay, cool, thanks, you know. You get all the information you can. And you have those other eight to ten people do the same. And then you come back together and you begin to build your plan. Now, what's interesting is, not this three weeks, but the next three weeks, we'll talk about building that great plan. But, but that's exactly what I would do. That's exactly how I would handle it. I would just informally cast the vision, see who comes on board. I'd take the ones that I trust the most, bring them to my house. I wouldn't bring them to a formal meeting, bring them to my house, or bring them to a, to a casual place. I would then show them all the research I, that I have gathered and see who buys off on that. Then I would have the first formal meeting. But even that, it's still going to be a small group of just two or three. And then we'll just repeat that exercise again and then try to get ourselves to 8 to 10. Once we have the 8 to 10, now we have a working committee, right? But that working committee is people that we can almost guarantee are on board. Because they, they have to be on board. Then what do I do? Then I do the research. Then I build the plan. And then I follow the buy-in strategies we just talked about to get everybody else in town on board. How much did what I just described cost? Yeah, how much that cost? And yet, how many initiatives are prevented from beginning because we're all trying to write grants to get money to do them? All. Not just about all. All. And that's why, you know, everybody, you know, I kind of, I, when we all first met, I dismissed Let Them Be Kids being nominated Volunteer Organization of the Year by the Prime Minister last year. But there was a reason we were nominated that. Now, we're all a bunch of idiots. I have no idea how that happened. But I think the reason is we use these principles. These principles work, not because they're coming from us, just because they are tried and true principles. Because what I just described is how things got done 100 years ago. That's how, that's how things got done 100 years ago. You sat down, I sat down, and it didn't matter the culture that we were in. This is how things have been getting done for thousands of years, and it didn't matter the culture we were in. You had a vision, you explained it to me, I bought into your vision, then we wanted to explain the vision to others, they bought in, and the next thing you know, we were getting something done. It's just been lately, in recent history, that we would go, well, we better go talk to the city manager, or we better go talk to the CAO, or we better go talk to the CEO over there, and we better get the grant from whoever. Were we applying for grants 100 years ago? No, but somehow civilization got built. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I've done a lot of Of course you have. And you know what? I realized the steps that I did take before in the past was like, I was one person that was like being asked to and to see if I was alive. And now I am helping with something that never happened before. I'm not the person that created the idea, but I'm helping. Mm -hmm. And why are you helping? Why did you buy it? You bought in based on a value that you hold dear, right? And, and there's probably others involved that bought in because of some facts and some, right? So this stuff isn't brain surgery. And I don't think you have to be a phenomenal leader. Oh, he's such a great, or she's such a great leader. No, it's a basic formula that anybody can deploy. There's three moms and four chips. Absolutely. But you know what? There's five moms that I met in the Duke. There's three ladies that I met in St. Albans, Newfoundland, who did one of our projects. They had never done anything ever. They were just fed up that their kids didn't have a playground. They raised $109,000 in 90 days. Got 400 citizens to turn out. What? And they just followed this simple formula. Because everybody's very about to share value, like the same idea of what they want. So who's going to support and take that? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it does take, sometimes initiatives 
are what I would call charismatically driven at first. You do need that one or two. And that's why I said, go find that one or two. You, you know, I just need other people to get involved. Go proactively go do it. Go talk to somebody, go talk to somebody, go talk to somebody, and see who was responds. But we're afraid that someone's going to go, well, let's go talk to United Canada. Who cares? Don't be offended by that. Don't, don't be dissuaded by that. Just know that, just know, and I'm going to say this going to sound bizarre. Most people aren't crazy. What do you mean? Follow now. Listen, this is really important. Most people aren't crazy, which means most people won't give their time, talent, and treasure to something that hasn't been done before. So only a few people are crazy enough to do that. So are, do you have to go find those crazy people? Yeah, you do. You have to go find those crazy people. And the way do you find it? You just talk to some people and then you figure out who's crazy and those are the people that show up to this first meeting. And I, I mean crazy in, in the most loving way. They have the ability to see what hasn't been. So you, somewhere in you, through your parents, through life experience, who knows how, but you have in you, you can believe in something, you can believe in something that hasn't been. Most people can't do that. Right? Most people can't do that. Final thought on this. Don't worry about who's in the room. In other words, we always get concerned, well, so-and-so didn't show up. So-and-so's not here. So-and-so, like all the guys from CP Services. We got like 15 guys from CP Services going through today's program. But they can't be here because of work and this and that. So I could be like, oh, man. We have uh, the 22 people, we got like four people. This is horrible. But you know what? We now had it because we have fewer people, we had a chance to really talk about something very tangible to you. So don't worry about who's not in the room. Small groups of people, properly motivated, focused on a common goal, not caring who gets the credit, always change the world. It's never large groups of people who only care about themselves, who are focused on their own best interest. They never change the world. So you're always going to start with a small group, okay? All right, we've gone a little long. So know this, you're going to get four emails on Pride, and over the next three weeks, we're going to talk about being a catalyst for responsibility. Okay, thanks a lot, everybody.